Um, I'm Stephen Donnelly uh, from uh, Indace. So we are a Sharkfest sponsor this year uh, and have been for, for quite a few years. Um, we are a packet capture and network history company. Uh, we have a table down at the vendor area, so if you want to find out more about what we do, uh, you can do that. Uh, and this year we're also sponsoring the Group Packet Challenge, which we haven't talked about very much yet. Um, Sake Block is uh, organizing that, and uh, you probably want to, to join that if you can. There will be teams of about 10 people, and you can um, form your own team, or you can go to the dinner on, I think it's uh, Wednesday night, there'll be a, a group event. So you can find out more about that at the end day's table too. All right, so um, a couple of things. Uh, this is a new talk for Sharkfest, so what would be really great is at the end, if you can uh, fill in the survey and just give us a bit of feedback as to uh, is it the right level, is it interesting, is it something we should expand, is it something we don't need, whatever. Um, the surveys are through the guidebook app. The surveys are anonymous, so we don't know who is filling in the feedback, but if you are commenting on it, it might be useful if you could just say roughly what your level of experience is. Uh, that would be kind of helpful. Um, we're in the uh, guide as an intermediate talk. I kind of pitched this as more of a beginner's talk, so it'd be interesting to get people's uh, kind of feel for where you think it is. All right, I'm going to give this presentation sitting down because I need to run the, the PC, so I apologize for that. Okay, so the topic of the talk is how long is a packet? Does anybody know? I see Patrick at the back. Anybody else? It depends. That, that's actually probably the best answer, doesn't it? We don't really have enough information to answer that question straight up, how long is a packet? Um, so that's kind of what we're going to try and get into. So what do we need to know in order to know how long is a packet? A few different things. Um, we need to know how long, how many, what, what's the size of the packet in bytes and what is the uh, bandwidth of the link that we're talking about, so what's the maximum rate we can send uh, data on the link, and then what's the, the speed at which signals travel through that link. So a simple calculation will tell you what it is, and if you look at the units uh, on the calculation there, you can see that the units cancel out to give you meters. So bits divided by bits per second is just the amount of time that it takes to send that number of bits. And then the velocity is the speed at which the signal is going to propagate through the network link. So we need to pick a, a, a nominal packet. So we're going to pick a 100-byte packet at 1 gigabit. So the first question is, well, how long is 1 bit? So if we work it out, 1 bit divided by 1 billion bits per second, that tells us how long it takes to send a bit. So obviously it's 1 nanosecond, 1 billionth of a second. And then we need to decide what media we're going to send this packet over. So for a fiber network, the speed of light in glass is about uh, two-thirds the speed of light in a vacuum. So a radio signal is actually much faster than a fiber network. So when people complain about the Wi-Fi being slow, you can tell them, well, hey, it's faster than the fiber network is. Um, and depending on the cable, you may find that uh, the velocity factor for cable networks can be a bit faster than it is for fiber as well. So actually, propagation-wise, fiber is actually fairly slow. Um, so these are approximate. Speed of light is about um, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So two thirds of that is about two times 10 to the eight meters per second, which makes it quite easy. So one bit at one gigabit in a fiber network is about 0.2 meters long which is about, you know, this big, it's about eight inches, which coincidentally, I noticed just before I came into this uh, talk, is actually the measurement that we have on our stock photo, eight inches. So that's one bit as I send it. Okay, so if one bit is 0.2 meters long, how long is our 100-byte uh, packet gonna be? So you can work it out, 100-byte um, packet, 800 bits, divided out, it's 160 meters, which is about 525 feet. Now, when you think about it, what that means is, if I have a piece of fiber which is more than 160 meters long, there is a point in time at which I've finished sending the packet into the fiber, but it hasn't started arriving at the receiver yet. So at that point in time, the packet just exists as a series of light pulses traveling through the fiber. 
It's pretty neat. Um, so, well, what happens if you have a really long piece of fiber? How much data could you store in it? Could this be a useful way of, of storing information? Probably not. Um, let's imagine that somebody, very kindly for us, laid a new fiber connection from here in San Francisco, approximately, to Vienna. Why Vienna? Well, Vien Vienna is where the previous Shark Fest was. So the last Shark Fest that uh, ran was in Europe. Uh, at the end of last year in Vienna. And that distance, you can go to this great website, Great Circle Map, will tell you the shortest distance that you can get over the surface of the Earth is 9,677 kilometers, which is about 6,000 miles. Uh, if you could go straight through the Earth, it would be shorter, but you'd you know, be pretty expensive to do that. So we'll just lay our fiber over the top. So. Uh, how much data would we actually fit into that? So if we ran our new piece of fiber at one gigabit and we started sending data into it, how much would you fit into the fiber? So over that distance, again, exactly the same calculation, you get 48.4 million bits of data you could put into the link before the first bit started coming out at the other end, which is, when you divide it by eight, about six megabytes. So that's a pretty expensive way of storing six megabytes of data. You're probably not gonna use it for that. So, so far we're not, we're not talking about packets, we're just talking about sending bits into the, into the link. If we actually wanted to transfer some data between San Francisco and Vienna or, or vice versa, how would we do it? So let's say we, we sent UDP packets, so it's got the IP layer, we'll send some UDP packets. So UDP is not reliable, right? It's a datagram service, there's no feedback, there's no flow control, there's no rate limiting or anything. So the, the sender can send packets at whatever rate they like. So if I have this connection, I can put packets in at one gigabit, and they'll come out at the other end um, about 40 milliseconds later, something like that, 48 milliseconds later. But the problem is, if my local connection is faster than that, say I have a 10 gig connection, I can send packets at two gigabits a second. And then what will happen is when it hits that link, half of the packets get dropped. And UDP doesn't have any way of communicating that back to you. So you don't know that those packets are dropped. They just disappear. So probably not a great protocol for transferring important information, uh, like files, for example. Um, you can build your own feedback on top of that uh, at the application level, so at a higher level on top of UDP. And uh, the most common form of that is, is at the moment is probably QUIC, which is originally stood for quick UDP internet connections. And it came out of Google. Uh, if you want to see some, uh, do a capture on your uh, laptop and browse to gmail.com or to google.com. And what you'll find is that rather than HTTP over TCP, they'll actually use a quick connection underneath. And Wireshark has dissectors for that, so you can have a look at it. But more commonly, uh, most of us mere mortals uh, would just use TCP. So TCP is a reliable service. You send data, you wait for an acknowledgement. So if we sent one packet, say a 100 byte packet, which is 500 feet long, we sent it to Vienna, and then we waited to get an ACK back for it before we sent the next packet, our bandwidth is gonna be very small, right? So it takes 48 milliseconds for the packet to get there, it takes another 48 milliseconds for the packet to get back. So the bandwidth that we achieved over that, you know, 96, uh, milliseconds is only about 17 kilobits a second. So it's, it's pretty poor given that we have a gigabit link. Uh, if we sent a larger packet, like a, a thousand byte packet, then um, that would give us 10 times. We get 170 kilobits, which is a lot better, but it's still not great. So we clearly need to be able to send more data than a single packet before we wait for the acknowledgement to come back. And TCP, of course, thought about that. Um, in TCP, the amount of data that you're allowed to send before you have to stop and wait for an acknowledgement is the receiver window. So the person at the far end of the link will tell you how much data you're allowed to put into the link before you have to stop and wait for an acknowledgement. And because it's TCP, it's reliable and we have retransmissions. So any of that data that you've, you've sent and is unacknowledged, the sender has to hold on to it and buffer it in case it needs to be resent. If the window is small, then obviously transfer is very inefficient. And the sender doesn't influence the receive window. So this is actually kind of an important point. If I'm opening a connection to Vienna, I can't um, 
request that the guy in Vienna uses a larger window. There is nothing in TCP that lets you do that. So how do you know what window size you should use in order to get the full gigabit out of our connection? So the, uh, there's a rule of thumb, which is you want two times the bandwidth delay product. So what's the bandwidth delay product? Well, we just worked that out. So the calculation of how much data can you put into a link uh, to fill it up, that's the, um, the, the bandwidth, so one gigabit multiplied by the delay, which was our 48 milliseconds, our six megabytes, that's the bandwidth delay product. It's a one-way thing. So for your TCP window, you want to send enough data so that when I start sending, I'm going to send the first six megabytes, and then it's going to start arriving at the other end. The guy at the other end then sends the first ACK back. It's going to take another 48 milliseconds for that ACK to come back. So I need to send another six megabytes of data into the link while that's running. So that gives us a 12 megabyte number. Um, the way that TCP is uh, advertised, you have a 16-bit field inside the TCP header for the uh, TCP uh, receive window advertisement. Um, but that only lets us advertise windows up to 64 kilobytes, which is not going to be enough for our 12 megabytes. So window scaling is a mechanism that was invented quite early on, um, IRC 1323. And it lets you say, take the number that I'm putting in the TCP window and multiply it up by a scaling factor. Uh, the larger scaling factor that you can have is 2 to the 14. It's just the way the fields are defined, which lets you have a maximum uh, window size of 1 gigabyte. So our 12 megabytes easily fits in here. And uh, just as a note, the, the RFC, the example that they used in there, was a T1 connection, which is 1.5 megabits with a 50 millisecond delay. So they considered that to be a high bandwidth delay at the time that they invented TCP uh, scaling. And they didn't need a very large window for that, but it was more than 64K. So a gigabyte sounds like a pretty big number. And in our example, we need, say, 12 megabytes, so a scale factor of 2 to the 8 would work. That would give us 16. So that would work pretty well. But I hear you objecting. I, I hear you saying, but Stephen, last time I browsed to a website in Europe, I didn't reconfigure my TCP stack. I didn't change my OS configuration. So did I internet wrong? You know, it, it was, was there some mistake that I made? I should have, should have been editing something somewhere in my, in my config system. Uh, and the short answer is no, probably not. And there, there's a couple of reasons for that. First one is you probably weren't expecting to get a gigabit over a single TCP connection. You're browsing to a website in Europe, you're probably expecting one or two megabits. That's probably what you got if it was a good day. So, hey, that's fine. The second reason is modern operating systems deal with a lot of this stuff for you. TCP auto-tuning. So what happens is when your operating system opens a TCP connection, it doesn't allocate a really large buffer like 12 megabytes straight up because that would mean that every TCP connection would need a lot of memory associated with it. Most of them don't need it, so that's wasting memory. Uh, so what they do is they start with a relatively small buffer. If they work out that they're on a, on a high, uh, bandwidth, uh, high um, bandwidth delayed product link, or what's called, sometimes called a long fat network, um, then they will increase the size of the buffer automatically. So modern OSs support auto-tuning. Um, what is the limit of auto-tuning is a good question. So um, from the research that I did, Microsoft Windows will auto-scale up to about 16 megabytes. And that's since about Windows 2000 or something like that. So quite a long time, I think. Um, now that means that for our link to Vienna, if we have Windows machines at each end, they should auto-scale and you don't have to go and manually edit anything. So you actually can get a gigabit per second over a single TCP connection. Linux um, is a little bit more complicated. It depends a lot on which kernel version you have and a little bit on your distribution and how it sets things up by default. Um, from what I can see, Linux will auto-scale to about 4 megabytes uh, by default. But on the other hand, the socket memory limit is only a couple hundred kilobytes. So if you are trying to run a high bandwidth TCP connection over a long connection, you probably need to go on the internet and look at some tuning guides. And there's quite a few different ones. Uh, available and they will take you through how you can adjust the settings uh, on your stack to get uh, a high bandwidth connection. So if that's true, then, then why did we bother just spending all this time learning about bandwidth delay product and how you calculate it and what your window size needs to be? Well, 
not everything connected to the internet, surprisingly enough, is a, uses a modern operating system. There's lots of old devices on there, and there's lots of embedded devices, IoT devices, which have very limited stacks. They may not support all of the different features and things like uh, auto-tuning. Um, I remember I had a piece of network test equipment which uh, you could telnet into over an Ethernet connection. It's like a 10 megabit Ethernet connection. Um, but internally, the uh, Ethernet port would, had a serial connection behind it to talk to the microprocessor that ran the network gear. And if you sent packets to it too quickly, it would overrun the serial link and it didn't do flow control properly and it would corrupt it. So when you're typing commands over the TCP session on your, over Ethernet, you had to type fairly slowly. So you could type it, it was OK, but if you tried to script things, then it would just overrun. Um, so some devices connected to the Internet are actually quite poor. Uh, the second problem is, well, is 16 megabytes enough? You know, what, what, happened if you, what would happen if you had a higher bandwidth link or you had a longer path? It wouldn't scale far enough, so you would still have to manually adjust the caps on the auto scaling or manually set the, the size of the, uh, of the TCP window. So what's an example of a really long path? Um, here's one from the Earth to the Moon. So this is a, a cool diagram from NASA, um, Dr. James Donahue. Uh, this is a scale picture, so the Earth and the Moon are to scale and the distance between them is to scale. And the moving point shows how long it would take a signal traveling at the speed of light to travel from the Earth to the Moon and return. So when you're watching that bouncing backwards and forwards, uh, you can imagine that being a TCP SYN, and you can see the SYNAC coming back, and then you can see the ACK, and then you can see the data. So it's going to be very, very high latency on that link. Um, OK, so we know what the delay is, roughly. Um, it says it right, uh, right here on the slide. So 1.255 seconds each way, so close to 2.5 seconds round trip time, uh, 384,000 kilometers. But what, the, what bandwidth can you get from the moon? Right, so if I'm, if I'm at the moon and I want to send some data to the Earth or vice versa, what bandwidth can I get? So in 2013, there was a, um, a satellite orbiting the moon um, with a thing on it called the Lunar Laser Communications Demonstration. And that was an optical communication system. So rather than using radio waves, it actually used lasers and telescopes on Earth. And it was able to send from the Earth to the moon, uh, from, sorry, from the moon to the Earth, 622 megabits per second, which is actually pretty fast. And it's generally much faster than you get from uh, space-based radio communications. So that's actually a reasonably high bandwidth. And if you work out your bandwidth delay uh, product, it's 99.6 megabytes. Um, now, the bandwidth in the other direction was lower because the telescope on the satellite is smaller. But you really, if you're sending data from the moon to the Earth, you only need enough bandwidth in the return path to get the ax back if you were using TCP. Um, so if you were trying to use TCP to send pictures or video from the moon to the Earth, uh, your TCP window would need to be about 200 megabytes, which is fine, because as we saw, the maximum uh, TCP window that you can have is a gigabyte, so that would actually work okay. Uh, would TCP work from the moon? Um, I think so. So when you send a, a SYN to open a TCP connection, you start a SYN timer, uh, and that SYN timer will generally expire after a couple of seconds. Now, you won't have gotten the SYN act back yet, um, so you'll send the SYN again, but then you'll receive the SYNAC, so you should be able to open the connection. Um, slow start means it's going to take a very, very long time to actually ramp up to high bandwidth. So you probably wouldn't use DCP on this connection. Uh, there are space protocols uh, specifically for this purpose. And in fact, uh, NASA has a protocol called DTN, which is Disruption Tolerant Networking, and it's more of a store and forward protocol, and it's actually used already for communications between the International Space Station and the Earth. Um, if you had an even longer path, like Mars, you have something like th anywhere between 3 and 23 minutes of delay to get a signal at the speed of light to Mars, so you're definitely not going to use TCP for that. So a store and forward type thing, where you send a request one day saying, hey, I want a picture you know, slightly to the left, and then the next day a picture comes back uh, as a store and forward kind of thing. Okay, so back to Earth. Um, we've been talking about packets very generically so far, so let's get a little bit more concrete. 
how long is an Ethernet frame? So rather than just talking about TCP and IP. So we've probably all seen this diagram before. There's an Ethernet frame. You've got a destination and source MAC address, a type or a length field, depending on whether it's uh, 802.3, in which case it's a length field, or if it's Ethernet 2 standard, in which case it's a type field. You've got what I've called the Ethernet payload here. Uh, the 802 standard refers to it as a MAC client data field, but it, same thing. Uh, and then you have a checksum at the end, a four byte checksum. Um, but is that how long the packet is on the wire? And the answer is no, not quite. So there's a few extra things that happen with Ethernet. You have the preamble at the start of the frame, uh, start of frame delimiter, and an interframe gap. So nominally, the preamble is seven bytes, but it can be shorter. So when you send a packet, before you can start sending the destination MAC, you start sending the preamble. If it hits a hub, so you're in a, um, a collision domain network, then some of the bytes of the preamble can get eroded. So the purpose of the preamble is to allow you to lock onto the clock signal of the, of the packet arriving. Uh, and that can be quite short. You can have a zero byte preamble and, have, and then have a start of frame delimiter and it'll still work. The interframe gap, uh, happens after the packet, and during that time you're not supposed to start sending another packet. Um, the main reason for that is uh, rate adaption. So if you have a telco network that's using Sonnet, for example, there's one clock. Everybody uses the same clock rate on all links, so there's never a rate mismatch between an incoming link to a router and an outgoing link. But in Ethernet, every single link has its own clock source and it's usually a fairly cheap oscillator on your network card that's generating that bandwidth. So when we say it's a gigabit, it's a gigabit plus or minus 100 parts per million. So the standard allows for that. So if you think about it, if I'm sending packets to you and I'm at plus 100 million parts per second and then you need to output that packet if you're a switch onto another link that, which is at minus 100 parts per million, all of the packets that I'm sending you are not going to fit onto that link. And the way you deal with that is you shrink the interframe gap a little bit, and that allows you to catch up with the higher, slightly higher packet rate that you're going to be receiving. So that's why there's an interframe gap there. So the important thing, uh, you can see the orange line, hopefully at the bottom compared to the blue line, is there's a 20 byte difference. So you add those two things up, nominally you're going to get an extra 20 bytes on the wire. And that's the only thing you really need to remember about that. Um, so then some people said, well, hey, that's great, but what we really want to do is we want to be able to send uh, packets on a single physical Ethernet network, but we want to segment it into logical networks. So we want to have virtual networks. And what we want to do is we want to put in a, a VLAN identifier into the packet, um, but we still want to be able to send our 1500-byte Ethernet payload. So the guys, that, you know, the standards guys had to th think about it and they said, well, keeping the 1500 bytes is more important for the payload part than keeping the whole frame size the same. So we'll just grow it a little bit. We'll add an extra four bytes in. And the size of our maximum size of our Ethernet frame is now 1522, including the Ethernet overhead. And on the wire, that's 1542, which seems reasonable, right? So it's interoperable. It's very slightly bigger, but doesn't make too much difference. Um, but then the problem is, a whole lot of people came up with a bunch of other smart things they wanted to do. So telcos were using VLANs inside their networks to support multiple customers on a single Ethernet network. And then they found that their customers were also using Ethernet uh, VLANs inside their networks, and they wanted to bridge those VLANs from one site to another over, say, a metro Ethernet service. So they needed some way to encapsulate one VLAN inside another. Uh, and other people came up with other ideas, things like, well, um, what if we wanted to have Ethernet, we want it to be secure, so we want to have it encrypted at the link layer, and that's called Mac security. Uh, and then other people came along and invented virtualization, and they said, okay, well, I want to have a virtual machine, and I want to be able to move it around from one physical machine to another, so I need to be able to take an entire Ethernet frame and encapsulate it inside a different Ethernet frame so that when I move my virtual machine from one point to another in the network, I can just move the, the path that those packets flow over and nobody will even notice that the MAC address of the, of the machine has changed, so it can stay the same. And the guys at the I, you know, IEEE said, look, this is getting ridiculous. We're not going to keep changing the size of the Ethernet packet. It's, you know, there's clearly lots of different things that people want to do. So what we'll do is we'll come up with a thing called an envelope frame. 
So in an envelope frame, they said you can have up to 482 bytes of overhead. So that can be multiple VLAN tags, it can be MAC security, it can be uh, tunneling protocols. So there's, you know, um, VXLANs and there's uh, all those different tunneling protocols. But you still want to have your 1500 byte payload. So that total size is now um, 1984 bytes, I think it is. And the length of the entire Ethernet frame from the beginning of the MAC address to the end of the FCS is 2,000 bytes. So the maximum size Ethernet packet you're allowed to have is now 2,000 bytes, not 1,500. And when you include the link overhead, you're now at 2020 bytes. But Stephen, I hear you complain. What about jumbo packets? There are packets that are bigger than 2,000 bytes. I'm sure of it. I've heard something about it. It's 9,000 bytes, isn't it? Or is it 9,200 bytes or 9,600 or something like that, right? There's got to be a bigger packet than that. Um, so yes, uh, there are people who send larger packets than 2,000 bytes. They're not standards compliant. So it's not an 802.3 Ethernet frame anymore. Why did the IEEE not say, let's make jumbo packets are standard. Why not just have 9,000 byte packet? Why limit it to 2,000 or 1,500? There's kind of two main reasons for that. First one is interoperability problems. So if I'm an Ethernet device and I'm standards compliant and I'm sending my 1,500 byte packets and then somebody starts sending 9,000 byte packets, it's no longer going to interoperate. We're not going to be able to communicate with each other. Second problem is something called FCS weakness. Right, so remember at the end of each Ethernet frame there's a checksum which protects you against errors in the link. But as a packet gets larger, the checksum doesn't change in size. So if your checksum is 32 bits long, then there's 2 to the power of 32 different combinations of checksum that you can have. So if my packet payload is 32 bits long, then ideally there will be a different checksum for every possible packet that I can send. But if I send a packet which is, say, 64 bits long, it's only 8 bytes, there's now many different packets that you can send which must create the same checksum. So that's a checksum collision, right? Now that doesn't really matter as long as your packets are fairly small because the, the likelihood that if I have a packet, say, 1,000 bytes long, if I change just a few bits in the packet, so there's a little burst error, flip one bit, or just a couple of bits within a, within a single byte, the probability that the, both the old packet and the new packet have the same checksum is very low. It's extremely low, astronomically low. Uh, and that means that when you have a disruption in the network, you're still going to be able to detect the fact that there was some corruption. But as the packet gets longer and longer and longer, imagine a 9,000 byte packet. You've now got 2 to the power of 9,000 different potential packets. And at that point, the probability that ch flipping one bit will produce a different packet which has the same checksum is getting higher and higher. And so that means that Ethernet can no longer tell you that the packet that you received is not the packet that was sent. And that, that's a pretty serious problem. Um, you, you might say, but TCP has checksums, right? There's IP checksums, there's TCP checksums, so we're protected against that. It turns out, of course, TCP checksum is only 16 bits. It's not even 32 bits. So it's a weaker checksum than the Ethernet one is. So you can't really rely on that. It does give you a bit of extra protection, but you can't rely on that to guarantee that you're uh, going to be able to detect a corrupted packet. Uh, people who do use jumbo packets for things like iSCSI and so on um, often use a different checksum as well. So the, the, uh, the iSCSI payload will be protected by a different polynomial, but it's still only 32 bits. Um, now, I'm not going to say too much more about Jumbo Packets because, as it says on the slide, session 12, uh, Patrick Kinnison, it's a wave at the back of the room, uh, has a session uh, later on this afternoon where he's going to talk a lot about uh, Jumbo Packets and how to catch them. So if you're interested in that, it sounds like a great talk. I'm going to see if I can catch that. Okay. So, Wireshark. How does Wireshark report packet links? Well, here's a hint. It's not in inches, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, so this is where we get to the inevitable Wireshark live demo. So this is a, a Shark Fest, is a, is a Wireshark-related conference, so we need to do something with Wireshark. So let's have a look at some uh, trace files and uh, see if we can see what Wireshark is doing. So... 
first of all, load Wireshark. Second of all, uh, duplicate screen. Hooray, okay, make it a bit bigger. Okay, is that is that visible from the back? Can you guys see that okay? Yeah? Okay, not hearing any objections. All right, so how long is uh, a packet according to Wireshark? So in the default uh, column uh, list, there's a length column, which is great. Uh, we look at the first packet here. Um, hopefully you can see the mouse cursor. It's 60 bytes long. Well, that's a bit weird. Didn't we just spend half an hour going over the fact that the smallest Ethernet packet can have a 64 bytes? So what's happened here? Well, Wireshark will let us sort by any of these columns. So by default, we're sorting by the sequence number of the packet, so 1, one to 10. But we just click on length, we can sort by packet. 42. Well, that's even smaller than 60. So we've got a 42 byte packet. <coughs> what's going on here? Okay, so we click on that to select it. In the, uh, the the packet view in the lower left side, it says frame 16, 42 bytes on the wire. Uh, and it even converts it to bits for us. It says it was 336 bits on the wire. Now that seems like a fairly authoritative statement, right? It seems pretty definite that it knows that's how long it was. So let's open the frame dissector and see what, see what it says in here. Uh, so there's a couple of different things in here. We've got this field here is frame length, 42 bytes, 336 bits. The highlighting, highlighting doesn't show up very well on the screen, but uh, and this this column down here, capture length 42 bytes, 336 bits. Uh, so that's a bit odd, isn't it? Because we we just found out that this is not a standard packet, so it, but there's no there's the, there's no errors being reported on it, so it's not saying that it's corrupted or anything like that. So what happened? Well, this particular trace file. Uh, in fact, we can look at the Ethernet part of the header as well. Let's have a look. Okay, so it has an ARP uh, type field set. So that means it wasn't an 802.3 frame, it was an Ethernet 2 frame. So we don't have a length. So Ethernet header is not telling us how long the packet was, so we can't sort of compare that to see. Um, if we look at the uh, uh, contents, then it will highlight for us over here which part of the packet is the ARP request. So if I click on that. There we go. So that part of the packet, which is all the bit that it's captured, is the ARP request. Um, but where's the checksum? So this capture file is one that was captured, I think, on this laptop, regular NIC. And what's happened is somewhere between the wire, the packet being on the wire, and the packet being delivered to Wireshark, we lost the checksum and we lost the padding at the end of that packet. So Wireshark has very confidently said it was only 336 bits on the wire, but it wasn't. We know that it was really 64 bytes, and in fact it was 84 bytes if you include the preamble and the interframe gap. So was that Wireshark's fault? Probably not. Um, Wireshark could have warned us. It could have said, hey, by the way, I know Ethernet packets really aren't that small. It must have been longer. But it doesn't generate an expert info to tell you that. So is it possible to have a PCAP file which does show you all that stuff? And the answer is yes. So here's a different PCAP file. Uh, and we see some 64-byte packets in here. If we sort it by length, we get the smallest one. Yep, this is all very small packets. And if we have a look at it, uh, it is ARP again. So it's the same protocol that we saw before. Let's take that out of the way. Uh, when we look at the frame information here, it's now saying 64 bytes on the wire, 512 bits. Um, it's not saying 84, but it is saying 64, so that's pretty good. We look at the Ethernet 2 header again. It's up, so there's no length there. But it tells us a couple of interesting new things we didn't have before. So now it says trailer. So what it's saying is at the Ethernet level, I was asked to send a packet that was too short. So I just padded it with zeros. And then at the end, we have the checksum, which is correct. So it's found the checksum, it's calculated what it should be for that packet, and then confirmed that it's correct. So this is a trace file where we are capturing the, the, the frame checksum. 
And that will depend a lot on what your capture hardware is, which operating system you're on, and so on. So you can very easily find out just by doing a capture, have a look at your trace file, and see whether or not you're getting the checksum at the end. And if we look at the ARP part of the packet again, we can see it's the same length, so we're getting the same information, but uh, there's some padding after it. And the standard says the padding has to be zeros, which is good, right? So it means that if you don't capture it, it doesn't really matter, because it's only zeros, except if it isn't, right? So I mean, if I was writing some malware, some advanced persistent threat, and I wanted to communicate between two machines on an ethernet, I would send really short packets, and then I would put stuff in the padding. And then there's a good chance that if you're capturing that uh, link and you're putting it into an IDS or something like that, it's never going to see the, the information that's supposedly padding. Right. So that's kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, OK, so what else have we got? Um, where are some other interesting trace files? So here is one um, which is from Unleash. Uh, networks. I was looking for an example of this, I couldn't find one, so there's a great blog by a uh, guy at Unleash. When you look at this trace file, the first packet here is 2,962 bytes long. So it's not an Ethernet standard packet. It might just be a jumbo packet, right? That's, that's one possible explanation. So let's sort by length. We'll just see what we've got here. So 66 bytes is the smallest. And if we s reverse sort and scroll up to the top, always have to scroll up to the top, uh, then we've got a packet here which is 23,232 bytes long. So that's even bigger than a jumbo packet. So what's going on there? Well, we can have a look at it. So Ethernet 2, so there's no links field, unfortunately. So it just says uh, IPv4. What does IP say about it? Well, IP says the total length is 23,220 bytes. So that sort of confirms what we saw from, the, from Wireshark, right? This is a 23,000 byte IP packet. How did we get it? Well, it wasn't really that long on the wire again. What's happened here is the networking card has a segmentation offload acceleration, right? So the operating system wants to send a big chunk of data to the network. It gives it to the network driver as a big chunk, 23K. The networking driver itself will segment that up. So even though it looks like one IP packet here, when it hits the wire, it will be whatever the MTU was on that interface. So it might be 1,500, it might be 9,000, it might be some other crazy number in between, or even smaller than that. But if you're capturing on, the, on an end device, so if I'm capturing on a machine which is part of the communications, and I'm just using the network, what you're seeing is not really the packets on the wire, it's the packets that the operating system saw coming from the application. So that's something to keep in mind as well. And in fact, when you think about it, not only is this packet number 66 uh, bigger than it would really be on the wire, it actually represents more than one packet. So that one packet is actually going to be five or six packets on the link once you've segmented it out. So if I was comparing the number of packets that I caught on this packet trace to a number of the number of packets that I catch I caught through a tap or a span port, the number of packets isn't even going to match up. So you have to be a little bit aware of that. So easy to find out. Uh, interestingly enough, you can also, uh, in the statistics menu in Wireshark, there is also a packet length uh, dialog. Unfortunately, these dialogs don't scale when you do the control plus thing to blow the text up. So it's a little bit hard to see. Um, but the top line says the minimum packet size was 66. The maximum size was 23, 232, if you can make that out. And then it has a nice histogram of what the different sizes are. So if you don't want to sort a large trace file by top and bottom, you can just look at that. Yeah, question? What's that called when the MIC has the offload? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it does. Um, it's generally called a segmentation offload. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, there are a number of different names. So different uh, network card manufacturers and different operating systems use different names to refer to that. Um, so I do have a slide on that in a minute, and we can uh, see what some of those names are. Good question. Yep. So, so TSO, sometimes it's referred to as TSO or uh, GSO, uh, generic segmentation offload, those kind of things. Um, not all protocols generally support them. Yep. Can you just come in that there, there's also on the receive side, you mm -hmm. have a large receive. 
That's true. Yeah, absolutely. So in this case, this may have been a trace file taken of a packet that I was transmitting. But if you are receiving a TCP a series of TCP packets from the network, the, net, the network adapter itself can actually coalesce those together and present it as one giant TCP segment, which is the receive equivalent of that offload. Why would you do that? What's, what, you know, what, what's the advantage of doing that? You're not actually uh, saving what you're sending on the wire, right? What you're doing is you're reducing the effective packet rate that your operating system and your application has to deal with. So if I'm an application and I'm sending data, I'm going to hand information to the uh, operating system in chunks of a megabyte or something like that. The operating system has to segment that down into 1500 byte packets and send it. If it only has to break it up into, say, 64K chunks, then it doesn't have to send as many. So that's more efficient CPU-wise. And we can allow the networking card hardware to do the segmentation for us. So that's, that's the general idea. OK, uh, one more example. So here's this one. So uh, another thing that you may come across when you're looking at trace files is something like this. So here is an ICMP ping request. In fact, here's an ARP packet. This ARP packet is 80 bytes. So we've gone from our ARP packet being 40-something bytes to being 64 bytes. Now it's 80 bytes. So, so what's happening this time? Uh, so we have a look at it. There's the ARP part. Here's the Ethernet frame part. This is just showing the, the header part. We've still got these zeros in here. So there's a series of zeros, and then there's some other stuff. So what's happened in this case is the packet has gone through a packet, uh, a network packet broker, or NPB. So network packet broker is a really handy device. Indace doesn't make these, by the way, so uh, this is not competitive with us at all. Um, it's a device where you can have multiple links that you want to monitor connected to a device, and then you can programmatically tell it, hey, I want to capture packets from this port and this port, and I want you to apply a filter to it, I maybe want you to load balance it and then send it to your, my capture device. And when it does that, it can add a trailer, a header or a trailer. So this particular one, um, kindly uh, given to me by uh, Matthew Grossvener from uh, Exablaze, they have a, a packet broker product. Um, this is an example of their trailer. So if you are capturing packets using Wireshark or TCP dump from the output of a packet broker, you get these extra bytes on the end of the frame. This is not a bad thing necessarily, right? So what are the fields that are in there? And there is a dissector in Wireshark, so this is already showing up as an Exablaze trailer. It's detected it automatically. Um, so the first field of the trailer is the original checksum. So that field there is um, showing us, get it to highlight the right field. Um, that shows you where the original packet ended. So we see the original packet, we see the zeros of padding, and then we see the checksum. So if you wanted to, you could cut the last part of that off, everything after that, and then you've gotten back to what was on the original network link. Then after that, you've got a device ID, so it tells you which packet broker it was that did the capture, which port on the packet broker did the packet come from, came, came from, and what was the timestamp when the packet went past the packet broker? And the reason for that is the packet broker may have to do some buffering, right? So the time at which you timestamp it in TCP dump or Wireshark is a little bit later than when it passed through the packet broker. And the packet broker can give you a nice accurate timestamp for that. Then there's actually a byte of padding, uh, which is the zeros there, which is, I guess is reserved. And then there's another checksum, which is the checksum for this Ethernet frame, the one that's been encapsulated in. Um, generally, these trailers are optional. There are no standards for them. Every manufacturer does it differently. Some of them include the original checksum for the packet. Some of them don't. Uh, they have different timestamp formats and so on. There are a number of them which are decoded by Wireshark. Um, sometimes Wireshark won't know which particular type of trailer you have present in your packet trace. It can't guess. So you have to manually select it. You may have to force it to say, OK, I know it's this particular type of trailer, so decode it as that. Um, another trick which packet brokers sometimes do is uh, rather than adding a trailer on the end of the packet, which modifies the packet that you're seeing, right? So we now have an incorrect packet length. What they'll do is they'll just add a new VLAN tag on the front. So if packets came from port 20 of the packet broker, they might put VLAN tag 20 on it. And that's fine. Again, Wireshark can deal with that very easily. The only thing you need to keep in mind when you're looking at that packet trace is that VLAN tag wasn't on the original network link. It was added by the packet broker. 
So that's changed the length of the packet and it's added something that wasn't originally there. So as long as you know about it, it's fine. Um, if you're doing a PCAP NG trace file and you know that you're using a packet broker, it's a very good idea to put the information about that into the packet comment, into the trace file comment rather, right? So if I then, if this was a PCAP NG file, I could go statistics, capture file properties, and then in the comment field here, I could have something saying, oh yeah, this went through an exablaze thing and I had the timestamps turned on and, and whatever else. Uh, but if you send it through a PCAP file, PCAP files don't support comments. So if I try and add a comment here and save it to PCAP, it's just going to lose it. Okay. All right. So let's uh, switch back to PowerPoint. for it to do its magic. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And of course the AV gets confused. All right, so that's where we were. <coughs> Okay, so just as a recap, and if you're looking through the slides later, you don't have the uh, the recording of the of the demo. Wireshark reports two different numbers, right? It reports a length and a captured length. So the length is uh, what Wireshark believes the length that the packet was originally on the wire, and that's the number that gets reported as length on the wire. The cap length is if the packet was truncated during the capture process. So if I said let's set a snap length, and let's set it, let's only capture the first. 96 bytes of the packet, then that's going to be the capture length. And it either comes from libpcap, if it's a live capture, or it comes from the file format. So Wireshark can open lots of different file formats, uh, but every file format has to tell Wireshark essentially those two numbers. So even if internally the file format has a different kind of definition of those, it has to calculate the equivalent values to give it to uh, Wireshark. LibPCAP, if you're doing a live capture, gets the packet link from the operating system. The operating system gets it from the network card driver. The network card driver, generally speaking, is getting that link from the hardware. And somewhere in that stack of kind of Chinese whispers, if you excuse the expression, um, something is often going to truncate off the checksum and the padding. So the, the NIC has recognized that it's ARP, it knows that it's padded, even though there's no length field, and it's trimmed all that stuff off and said, well, the only bit that you're really interested in is, is the packet part. Um, and so as an extra point there, which is probably worth noting, uh, it's not on the slide, is um, packet traces from NICs, so you're capturing uh, packets on the link. Um, if there's something wrong with that packet, and the checksum is wrong, then the network card will generally drop it immediately. So the network card internally will count that you had a checksum failure and drop it. You won't see it in the TCP dump output. Uh, so it's always a good idea when you're doing captures like this to um, go to your switches or go to your operating system's uh, statistics about the interface and look to see were there any packet drops reported. So there was some sort of overrun, I didn't capture all the packets, which you may or may not get from libpcap, depending on uh, what software stack you have and which drivers you have and so on. Um, and also whether there are any checksum errors. So those will not be recorded in a pcap capture. Okay. Uh, so yep, so there's a little bit of uh, review there. So we talked a little bit about receive segmentation offload, transmit segmentation offload, uh, generic segmentation offload, generic receive offload. These are all different terms that are used by different operating systems. Yeah, question? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm Cap length. Okay, so the question was, what is the cap length? Um, so there are two different numbers that we saw there in the in the frame uh, dissector in Wireshark, uh, and they were both the same number when we looked at it in that capture. Okay, so when you do a packet capture in uh, Wireshark, for example, or TCP dump, one of the options that you can set is how many bytes of the packet do I want to capture? 
And in the old days, TCP dumps default was, I think, 96 bytes. So it doesn't matter how long the packet is, I'm only going to get the first 96 bytes. And the reasoning for that is, well, it saves the amount of memory that I need, the amount of disk space. I'm probably only interested in the TCP headers anyway, because I want to do some you know, sequence number calculations or something. Uh, so if you do do that, then the PCAP will record the fact that it was, say, a 1500 byte packet, and it will record the fact that it only captured 96 bytes. So if you want to do a bandwidth calculation, you want to do a throughput calculation, you can still use the 1500 byte number, but when you look at it in the, in the dump, you're only going to get to first 96. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's an, another heat wave day today. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so why do we do that? Again, it's to receive. It's to reduce the effective packet rate. So re by reducing the, the rate that packets are hitting the operating system, you're reducing the number of interrupts. You're reducing the number of memory copies that you have to set up. Uh, so it makes things more efficient. And you may argue that hey, if our uh, NICs can do the segmentation offload stuff and that reduces the packet rate and we can have, say, 64K packets, then why would I use a jumbo frame? A jumbo frame is only 9,000 bytes. That's going to be a higher packet rate than one of these off offloaded things. So maybe jumbo packets aren't actually as useful as you might think, as long as everybody on the network is using these offloads. Okay. Um, so when you have those uh, things running, the reported receive and transmit packet links can be wildly wrong. Um, why would the limit be 64K? Why, why not have a segmentation offload that does a megabyte at a time? The reason is that the IP uh, total length field is 16 bits. So the largest IP packet I can send at one time is 64K. So that's why these segmentation offloads are usually limited to 64K. There is an experimental RFC on making those fields bigger so that you can have an extension and you can actually send, say, a one megabyte IP packet. But I don't think they've been ratified. So that's, that's experimental. Now another thing that you'll notice, and this often comes up in Sharkfest, when you're looking at a trace file, if you captured the trace file on the machine that was involved in the conversation, so it was the server or the client, uh, you'll get some checksum errors coming up. And the reason is that you're seeing the packet that was sent to the network driver and the network hardware, the network adapter hardware fills in the checksum. So you get zero checksums and that can be reported as an error. You can just turn that off. So you're not really seeing what was sent on the wire. Um, but it's, it's still useful, right? It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. So if you can, the workaround is to use a uh, port mirror on a switch, a span port or a physical tap in which case you're literally tapping the link that the packets went over, you will see everything about that packet, the real packet sizes, the real checksums that are on the wire. Uh, if you have network equipment that can capture frames that have bad checksums or can count them, then you can see those as well. Sometimes when we, we discuss this in a network packet capture section, the advice will be, oh, we'll just turn off the offloads, right? So if I, if I turn off these various different uh, accelerations, these segment, segmentation accelerations, then I will get the original packet lengths, right? But when you think about it, if that is your production equipment, if this is your production web server or your production file server, if you turn off those segmentation offloads, you're going to affect the performance, maybe quite significantly. So you probably don't want to do that on a production box. So this is why I wouldn't recommend turning off those network accelerations. If they're on, you probably want them on. You're better going somewhere else to do your packet capture if you can. So use a, a span or a tap. OK. And in fact, the performance degradation that you uh, introduce by turning off the accelerations may be worse than the problem that you were trying to solve even. So cure is, is worse than the, the illness in that case. OK, and then finally, we looked at some pseudo headers. So the example that we had there was Exablaze. Uh, there are a bunch of different ones. Um, if you're looking at uh, remote spans, so a span is usually just on a single switch. A remote span is where I have a, a switch that's not, that I'm not directly connected to is going to do the tap for me. And then it's going to forward those packets over a VLAN, basically, back to my local switch. My local switch will then decapsulate that and send the packet on the, on the monitoring link as if it was connected to that, that port directly. But if you're monitoring the connection in between, then you will see that extra VLAN tag. So that can extend the length of the packet that you're looking at. ER span is a similar thing, but it's tunneled over IP, I think. 
So again, it's going to encapsulate the packet in a new frame, and if you're looking at the link carrying that ER span traffic, the packets are going to look a lot bigger. Uh, another thing is that some link types that you can capture on in the PCAP already have pseudo headers on them. So you may have noticed in Wireshark you can do USB captures, which is pretty neat. So you can do that in Windows if you install the, the right driver. You can do it in Linux as well. When you do that, if you look at the, the Wireshark uh, USB packet that's captured, some of the bytes that it reports are actually not on the USB wire. It's metadata about the device addresses that uh, the PCAP is usefully telling you. So it's really interesting stuff, but it doesn't reflect the actual length of the packet. And then finally, packet brokers obviously can add uh, pseudo trailers or VLAN tags. Okay, so what about calculating speed? So if we're changing the length of the packet, that's going to affect the, the, the speed or the, or the rate that we're going to calculate for those things. So if you think about a network link, at any one instant in time, either there is a packet on the link or there is not. Right? Any one particular instant, there is either a bit being communicated or there isn't. So the link is either 0% utilized or 100% utilized. But as soon as you start looking over a period of time, then there's the question of, well, what fraction of the time was the link being used to send packets and what fraction of the time was it not being used to send packets? And we generally refer to that as throughput. So if over a one second period I transfer a certain number of bits, then I can say I transferred this many million bits per second. And the other parts of that second were not transferring bits. Okay, so we often normalize it to bits per second. So if I send one gigabyte in an hour, that's a throughput number. Gigabyte an hour is a throughput number. And if you normalize it, it'll come out to about 2.2 megabits. So that's a more common way of talking about it, but the period doesn't have to be just over one second. So if I have a uh, amount of data transferred over 100 milliseconds, and then I report that in bits per second, the number can actually be higher than it would be if I just measured it over the whole second. Does that make sense? Um, the bandwidth is usually reserved to mean the maximum uh, speed of the link, right? the maximum throughput for link. So one gigabit Ethernet, one gigabit is the bandwidth. The throughput is uh, how much I'm actually using of it. And then the good put is the achieved data transfer rate. So that's usually talking about after retransmissions. So I might have a wide area link, I might have some packet drops, I might have some retransmissions and so on. It might take me an hour to transfer my one gigabyte of data. So that was a one gigabyte file that I sent. So one gigabyte in an hour is a good put number. So how does packet size Okay, thank you for that. We're back, yep. We need air conditioning. We need air conditioning. We've, we've had a few heat deaths already. I think we had a, a bit of a problem earlier, but... Uh, is there some water at the back for the people? Those are filled now? Ah, yeah, yeah. Oops. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, if anything is mic noise, so I don't sure if that'll work. Thanks, Janice. Okay, so thanks to the IT guys for uh, finding more batteries. Unfortunately, that means you have to keep listening to me. Um, <coughs> so what happens with uh, throughput? when we start thinking about packet sizes, right? So what's the difference between our one gigabit link and how much data we can get through it? So you think about layer one in our ISO uh, model, right, of networking, the physical link layer. If I send packets the smallest that I can, as fast as I can, it's gonna be an 84 byte packet, right? Because we all know that the smallest packet you can have on the wire is 84 bytes. 64 byte ethernet frame plus 20, 84. 
at full line rate, it's going to be 1.488095.2 approximately packets per second, million packets per second. Uh, everybody should memorize that number. It's a really great one to know. Um, layer 2, though, so if we think about what, what's the Ethernet throughput that we would get, well, if you, would, if you subtract the 20 bytes and you get rid of the preamble and the uh, interframe gap, which you don't normally see in a, in a PCAP capture anyway, what's left? So at that packet rate, 64 bytes is 761 million bits per second. So we've lost 28% of our network bandwidth already, and we're only at the Ethernet level. It only gets worse. So for IPv4, so if you think of the Ethernet payload bandwidth, so if we get rid of the source and destination MAC and the checksum, we're down to um, 46 bytes. That's 457 megabits. For TCP, which is the IP payload, so we include the TCP header, we're down to 300 uh, megabits. And if you just look at the TCP payload, so we get rid of the TCP header, we've only got six bytes of data left in that packet. We're at 71 megabits per second on a one gigabit link, which is 100% utilized. So we lost 93% of our uh, link bandwidth, which is pretty crazy. And so the short answer there is uh, don't set your MTU to like 64 bytes. You probably want to use bigger packets if you're going to send a lot of data. Um, so well, what would happen if the packet... Uh, so, so, so one thing here is if you are confused when you're looking at a, pack tra at a, at a uh, packet trace about what size is my packet? Is it 60 bytes? Is it 46 bytes? Is it 28 bytes? Is it 84 bytes? That is going to have a fairly big impact on the throughput that you calculate and on the link utilization. But for bigger packets, it's not so bad. So the same calculations for a 1500 byte packet, right? 1500 bytes with no VLAN headers, so 1538 on the wire, 81,274 packets per second. We're at 986 megabits for Ethernet. If we get all the way down to TCP, we're at 949 uh, megabits per second. We've only lost about 50 megabits a second. We're at 95% efficiency. That's not too bad, right? 5%, yeah, it's 50 megabits, but hey, it's, it's not too bad. Jumbo frames would be a little bit more efficient, but the main reason for that is to reduce the effective packet rate, not to gain 1 or 2% extra uh, throughput on the link. Okay. So, uh, some capture effects. Um, when you are thinking about calculating a throughput for a, a connection or for a network link, always use the, the length field, not the cap length. So the cap length, again, was just how much data we captured. Otherwise, you'll underestimate the throughput. If your capture system doesn't capture the FCS and the padding on the, on the end of short packets, and again, you're going to underestimate the throughput. So the real throughput and link utilization will be higher than what you would calculate because the number that you're using is smaller than the real number. If you are using a packet broker and it's adding a pseudo header trailer, then you're going to overestimate the throughput because a packet that on the wire was 64 bytes is being reported as 80. So you need to, for each packet, you need to subtract that pseudo header length before you do a bandwidth calculation. And then finally, NIC offloads can underestimate both the packet rate as well as the throughput and utilization, right? So um, we're going to see that 28K uh, frame, and that's going to be a smaller number than the number of packets on the link. A question? Yeah, do you know um, in wire chart IO graph, mm -hmm. which, what it uses to calculate the, uh, the IO? The reason I ask that is because I, I use another tool as well. Mm -hmm. A different number. Right. Which one is accurate? Yeah. That's a good question. So the, just for the recording, the, the question was, uh, in the Wireshark I.O. graph, which, which number is it using? So if you look at these, is it using layer 1 bandwidth, or is it using layer 4 bandwidth? Which one is it actually using when it reports uh, throughput or bandwidth for the link? I'm not sure. But it's a very good question to ask. So whenever you are given a graph which has bandwidth on the y-axis, your first question should be, OK, well, which, which bandwidth are you talking about? Are you talking about link utilization, which is sometimes shown in percentages, which is perhaps more accurate? Or is it the Ethernet bandwidth, or is it an IP bandwidth? And often the graphs are not labeled. Um, so I, I'm sorry I can't answer that question. I don't know exactly. But it is always a good question to ask. Yeah, is there any core developers that can answer that question? 
Are there any core developers who can't answer that question? No, nobody's willing to uh, to cop to that one. So no, unfortunately, I'm not sure. V one, go ahead. One of the things I do sometimes to compare what it's actually doing is I'll go out and grab the like frame length mm -hmm. and, and just compare what my colored graph looks like compared to the total and just see if, if it matches, then I'm using frame length. And, and I do that sometimes with, with different flows that I have in there to break it out. TCP Windows have graph overlay exactly on IO graph. Okay. It's got to be using the TCP layer. It might be. One of the things about the IO graph, I don't have Wireshark running at the moment, but when you look at the IO graph uh, in Wireshark, it does let you select which field you want to use. You can create a custom Y axis. Uh, so you can choose a length. Um, but I'm not sure. Sh I think it has a scripting field that lets you add some numbers to it. So you might be able to go back and add in the magic 20 to each one to try and get the numbers right. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. It's quite hard to use that dialogue. Probably needs some work. Okay. Um, so we're talking about capture effects. Um, so when you're doing provisioning, so if for some reason you're trying to work out what bandwidth do I need on my link, just think about the difference between the Ethernet util utilization and the IP bandwidth or the Ethernet bandwidth. Real networks have lots of different packet sizes. It's not going to be all very small packets, probably. It's going to be a mix of everything from 64 up to 1500. Um, if it's a enterprise network, your average packet size is probably going to be four or five hundred bytes because there's a lot of file transfers going on. Streaming media, voice over IP, financial traffic, gaming traffic, a lot of that stuff uses very small packets. So if you are provisioning a link uh, to carry a lot of gaming traffic, for example, or financial feeds, you may need to use a higher bandwidth link than you would expect because when you look at it and it says, oh yeah, I'm, in, I'm only doing 400 megabits, but if you looked at the link utilization, it might be 60% or 70%, not 40%. Okay, so you need to keep that in mind. And how are we doing for time? We've got a little bit more time. Okay. Um, <coughs> so what happens uh, when a packet which is too large arrives at a link? So different links have different maximum transfer units or different MTUs. Not every network in the world is Ethernet. Right, so there are wireless links, uh, there is still ATM networks, there's various different kinds of things. And some people send jumbo packets. So if I'm a, an Ethernet standard device and a jumbo packet arrives at me, what can I do with it? Um, really the only thing is an Ethernet switch, if I have a jumbo frame arriving and I'm trying to send it out a port that doesn't support jumbo frames, the only thing I can do is drop it and count it. But a router can be a bit smarter. So for IP traffic, where there's an MTU mismatch, you can do something a bit more complicated. So IPv4 has fragmentation, right? So I'm a uh, router in the middle of a path, a packet arrives, which is 1500 bytes. For some reason, the link that I'm sending it to, the MTU is smaller than that. I've got two choices. I can f take the IP packet and fragment into two pieces, which do fit into the MTU and send them on in which case the receiver at the far end then has to put those pieces back together. So it doesn't get reassembled during the path if the MTU goes up. They will carry all the way on to the endpoint. And that effect is transparent to the sender. So if I'm the sender, I'm sending an IP packet, I don't know the fact that it got broken into some fragments on the way. But this is generally considered a bad thing. It's pretty inefficient. It uses a lot of CPU in the routers, which means that it often goes through a slow path on the router, so you're going to add latency. Uh, and the, um, the fragments, if they are lost, can only be dealt with end-to-end. -end. So there's no way to resend a single fragment. So if a, a fragment gets dropped, the receiver can't reassemble it, it will time out. The sender will have to resend the whole original packet. It'll go and hit the same router and get fragmented again causing more load and more delay. So fragmentation is generally considered a really bad thing. So what you can do as a sender is you'd simply set the bit and say, well, don't fragment my traffic because it's bad, right? So don't fragment it. That's fine. But you still have the problem of what happens when it hits a router and the output link is smaller. The only thing that the router can do if it's not allowed to fragment it is it sends a destination unreachable ICMP message back with the, the type code is fragmentation needed NDF was set. That's actually the name of the message. It's a very long, very long name. Um, and that gets sent back to the original IP sender. 
So an Ethernet switch can't do that because it doesn't know who the original sender was. It only knows MAC addresses. But for IP, we can send that right back to the original sender. And what the sender should then do is, is send the packet again, but with a smaller size, or turn off the don't fragment bit, one or the other. And that's used in path MTU discovery. So path MTU is what's the largest packet I can send end to end between two IPs, rather than just on my local network segment. So that's fine for IPv4. It's been around for decades. IPv6 has also been around for decades, even though nobody uses it. Um, I read something the other day that uh, IPv6 is like 40% of uh, internet traffic in North America now, mostly thanks to cell phones. Um, so people do use it. Um, IP doesn't support mid-path mid fragmentation. When they were looking at IPv6, they said, this whole idea of fragmenting packets in the middle of a network at a router is a terrible idea. Let's just not support it at all. So that's fine. But it can do the equivalent of the of fragmentation needed. So what it can say is, if the packet's too large for the outgoing link, then you send an ICMP v6 packet too big message, which is a much better name right, than fragmentation needed and don't fragment set. There is no don't fragment bit in IPv6. The endpoints are then expected to do the PMTU thing, where if they get that packet too big message, they should resend it with a smaller size. But what happens if the protocol above IP doesn't support sending smaller messages? What if the message has to be a certain size? What IP can do is add an extension header for fragments. So if my protocol on top of IP says I need to send this 2,000 byte message, it has to be 2,000 bytes, the IPv6 layer can actually create two IPv6 packets which are smaller. The IPv6 layer at the other end will put those back together and then deliver the larger uh, PDU up to the next level protocol. So there are fragments in IPv6, but there's no fragmentation, so that's confusing. Okay, we're nearly at the end. So here's, here's a... Um, Here's a question for you guys. Here's a connectivity problem. This is from the early days of the internet. I came across this. How many people immediately know what the problem is? One, two, anybody else? Three, yeah, it's four. So there's a few people here who looking at that immediately know what the problem is probably. Uh, and the, the way it would be described is, I'm a home user and I'm trying to connect to my bank's website. Um, I can browse their website fine, but when I try and do a secure login for the internet banking, the connection locks up and I don't get anything back. It just doesn't work. So what's going on? So the first clue is here are the MTUs for the different links. right? So most of these connections are Ethernet and they probably have a 1500 byte MTU set, which is pretty standard, but there's an ADSL connection in the middle, so asymmetric digital subscriber line. And the way that this worked, at least at the time, is that it was PPP over Ethernet. So I take my IP packet, I put it into a PPP frame, and then I put that PPP frame into an Ethernet packet and send it uh, to my uh, you know, upstream, basically. So my, my home browser generates 1500 byte packet, sends it to my router, my router encapsulates it, uh, and its, its MTU is smaller than that. So a, a compressed PPP header is, is about 8 bytes. So this should work fine, right? So if I send a packet to the ISP, uh, which is 1500 bytes, then it should hit the ADSL router. Uh, if it doesn't have the don't fragment set bit set on it, then it should just fragment it and send the fragments to the bank. Um, if it does have the don't fragment bit set, then it should hit my router, my router should reply to me with a fragmentation needed message and I should reduce my MTU, so it works fine. Likewise in the opposite direction. But it doesn't work. So why doesn't it work? So if the bank sends a 1500 byte packet, it should travel through the link to the ISP, through the internet, to the ISP's router, uh, which is here, can't actually point to it, uh, and that should then either send a message back saying, I can't fragment it, or fragment it. So why didn't it work? And some of you already know the answer to this. Um, the answer is, the bank's firewall blocks ICMP, because ICMP is a known security hazard, right? So we don't want any of that ICMP stuff getting in or out of our network, because it could be bad, right? So what happens is, when I try and log into the banking website, the initial setup works fine. The SYN and the SYNAC go past. But as soon as the bank tries to send me a large piece of data, like their bank logo or something like that, it sends a 1500-byte packet. It gets all the way to the ISP. The ISP 
has a don't fragment <laughs> bit set on the packet, so it sends an ICMP message back, and the firewall drops it, because ICMP is bad. At which point, the bank never receives the ACK, I never received the packet, and so you get a TCP timeout, the bank sends the packet again. So the bank sends a 1500 byte packet through, it gets dropped, the ICMP comes back, the ICMP gets blocked at the firewall, nothing happens, it's a black hole. So the conclusion is, don't block ICMP, unreachable, right? That's a really bad idea. Um, the second question is, why was I able to browse the bank's website fine, but I wasn't able to do a secure login? Let's log into the banking website. Uh, and the reason is uh, the website was probably on a different web server and it probably wasn't using don't fragment. So it was probably fragmenting and it was probably working okay. Either that or they didn't have the same security on it. But the secure login for my banking is going to be an SSL connection. And SSL doesn't like fragmentation, so it sets the don't fragment bit typically. So encrypted con connections usually can't be fragmented. So if you're blocking ICMP and trying to do security, it's not going to work. Questions? No. OK, so quick recap what we covered. We talked a bit about the physical length of a packet, you know, eight inches per bit at a gigabit. Uh, the bandwidth delay product in long fat networks and what happens there, the TCP window scaling, Ethernet frame length, uh, Wireshark, how it presents us information about length of packets and how packet capture itself can affect the length of the packet that's reported, a bit about throughput calculations and we covered uh, fragmentation and, and PMTU. Hopefully that was a good overview. Um, thanks for attending. Um, what I would say is please do fill in the survey on the app, so use the guidebook app, fill it in. And do we have any questions? I see one, yeah. yeah um, I know that you recorded the, uh, your, your talk, mm -hmm. the slides, were the slides be available online? Yes, yeah. So we'll, I'll, what will happen is after the conference, all the presenters provide their slide decks to uh, Wireshark. Uh, the Sharkfest organization, and that'll go up on the website. And there will be links to all of the recordings of the videos, which go up on YouTube, and you can use those. Yeah. Question? Uh, question about that. So some of the frames are missing the uh, frame track sequence. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I think you said that it's part of the driver or part of the mix. Mm -hmm. so is that the hardware, or is that, is that a physical limitation, like the to program, or, or what, what would cause that? Okay, so the question was, uh, we saw in some of the trace files that there was no checksum captured, and the question was, is that a limitation of the hardware, or is it something that you can configure? I think that was the question, right? Yeah. So it, d it depends on the vendor. So different network adapters, uh, some of them will provide the, the checksum, some of them don't. In some cases, it's configurable. Most generic, you know, desktop desktop adapters, laptops, things like that, they usually won't capture the checksum and they will usually not give you the, uh, the padding. So you don't have that option. If you go and buy a professional uh, you know, packet capture equipment or card or, or something like that, they will usually capture all of that. Very few of them will capture the preamble though. Usually you just get from the, uh, from the beginning of the destination Mac to the uh, end of the FCS. Any other questions? If not, it's uh, lunchtime in 10 minutes. So, great. Thank you.